My name is Allison Felis, and this is I'll Follow You, a podcast featuring light and lively conversations about film, music, and creative culture, coming to you from the People's Republic of Rogers Park on the far northeast side of Chicago. So this episode has been in the works for a minute now, and I'm so happy to finally be able to share it with your ears. Today, I'm in conversation with my very dear friend, the singer Hilary Webb. Originally from Cherville, Indiana, Hilary began studying voice at the age of 13. She earned her bachelor's from Ball State University, where she studied with Mary Hagopian, and she earned her master's in vocal performance from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. She has worked with John Rutter, Dan Forrest, Beverly Sills, Barbara Hahn, and the King's Singers, and has been soprano section leader at Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in Greensboro since 2011, and has been part of the Bell Canto Company since 2003. Hillary has also performed with the Greensboro Opera, Capital Opera Company, and the Choral and Oratorio Societies of Greensboro, and has made guest appearances with the Triad Prides Men's Chorus a two-time National Association of Teachers of Singing Great Lakes audition finalist and Mu Phi Epsilon scholarship winner, she competes throughout the country and performs in the U.S. and in Europe. In our chat today, we talk about how we first met thanks to the robust community arts scene of Northwest Indiana of the 80s and 90s, and how the secret origins of the very name of this podcast go back to my days as piano accompanist for many of Hillary's solo performances. Seeing Placido Domingo live on stage the first time she ever went to the opera in Chicago, hanging out with Beverly Sills, how women and men's voices come to maturity in different ways, the spiritual dimensions of choral music, and the challenges of choral singing during these days of COVID and social distancing, and why she's specifically chosen not to live in New York, LA, or Chicago in order to pursue music professionally. And now, it's my great delight to share with you my conversation with Hillary Webb. So, hi, Hillary. I'm so, so excited to have you here with me today. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you. I, again, I cannot begin to tell you how incredibly excited and honored I am to be here with you. Oh, well, you know, I just know that, you know, we've known each other for a million billion years. And even though we're not in (laughs) as close of touch as we used to be just because of life, you know, I just, you know, respect your your opinions and respect your sort of musical uh, viewpoint on the world so much that I was like really excited to hear you just talk about like all the amazing things that you do. It is, uh, you know, and funny enough, I just was uh, talking to my dad about uh, senior solo night and you accompanying me the other day. So let me tell you, the fond memories of us collaborating together in high school were, uh, they're still, they're still talked about uh, and they still, uh, you know, warm the cockles of my heart uh, to this day, so... Well, and same. Yeah. I mean, just to give like background on that for for folks. So we grew up in in Northwest Indiana together. And there was like, yeah, there was a period of time when you were going around doing a lot of solo work that you asked me if I would um, accompany you on piano. And like, that was just some of the most fun that I had musically um, ever. I mean, I was going to say like uh, fun that I had in high school, but that was, was, yeah, very, very fond memories of uh, of learning that material and accompanying you in in all these different um, all these different places that you would be singing. That was super, super fun times. Well, I figured, you know, if I'm going to have someone who is capable and who has a great artistic ability, why not go ahead and make it who is someone you're equal and who Mm. is someone who is a peer, uh, you know, what better way to be able to, to showcase the talents of, of young people. And if we can partner and, you know, do that, that was the best thing to have. I mean, you used to play for me for contests and solo for solo contests. So for ISMA and you were my accompanist. Yeah. I mean, what better way to, you know, I was, I never, ever had to worry. I never had to think twice. I could hand you my music. You know exactly what to do. 
it was a, it was a great experience. I couldn't have asked for a better accompanist for that stuff. So I am eternally grateful for that because you 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 helped me. You listen. You helped me get into to undergrad. So why not? Why not give you credit for that? <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Yeah, those were and I. That's you know. I mean, that's sort of. Uh, you know, secretly why why this whole podcast project is called I'll Follow You because it's like I, I do I do thrive in that sort of like I just like being being in the background and sort of like helping bolster people in their creativity and in their practices and in what they're bringing to the world. And so if I can be sort of like the little like gremlin, you know, peeking <laughs> out from around behind the curtain yeah. and that's sort of like, you know, ra- doing the little razzle dazzle to, to put a, a nice framework around what somebody else is doing. Like, that's what I love to do. Not not quite Dobby the the house elf, but a little bit, a little bit yeah. busier. Yeah, I get same, it. I same idea. Understand? Though, yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> well, so with that sort of uh, you know going back in the wayback machine, little oh, uh, little <laughs> intro, like yeah, do you want to like give people uh, just sort of like a brief overview of of who you are and what you do and what you're about? I don't know that people really want to have that much time. That's a lot of time. Uh, let me see. So, well, as you said, you know, we grew up uh, in Northwest Indiana. So I'm Cherville, Indiana. And uh, I grew up, you know, in a musical family. My older sister was a, a pianist and, and a clarinetist and who does nothing with that today. I mean, she still plays occasionally, but now she's a quantitative futurist who is just crazy. Um and uh, I, from the time I can remember, I mean, I remember being five years old and being in my Wonder Woman underoos and singing Sea Cruise. Uh, I don't remember who the composer, it was like one of those 50s songs, but my dad would be blaring it. And I would just be singing it at the top of my lungs um, or and then having pots and pans and banging on it. So I guess I kind of knew at that point that music was kind of ingrained in my soul and it was in my blood. And I had started taking piano at that same age at five. And, um, and then I got involved in the Northwest Indiana children's chorus. Oh, you and were one of the uh, chorus kids. I was, but it was, it was, it was like when it was first founded before it was like NWI. So, uh, yeah, I was one of those. And then, um, you know, I got further and further invested in my singing and did more and more things and, and did competitions at the at South Lake Mall of all places. <laughs> I remember when they would have those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just like I remember dressing up like Dolly Parton. I had uh, a, like, you know, I remember doing that and singing nine to five. And my sister nice. had a company. Yeah. My sister had accompanied me at the time. I remember doing that. Or singing at my grandparents, um, they, my mom, my grandmother would have these luncheons for this this heart fund that she would co-chair for the, her synagogue, and she would have me perform for her luncheons. Um, or I would sing at Temple for High Holy Days and the Junior Choir or things like that. And then I was involved in community theater as I got older. And, uh, I think I, that's when I, I want to say is I got to be about sixth or seventh grade. I started getting involved in the community theater, um, at, uh, Highland Park. Uh, yeah, cause did, did we do Oliver together? Were you and Oliver? We did Oliver. I did. I was a Fagin okay. boy in Oliver. The year prior yeah. to that, I did Annie. I was Pepper in Annie. Um, that was a big deal. Like yeah. knowing, I mean, I I didn't do that show. I didn't. I wasn't keyed into the to that um, Parks Department's theater uh, group yet. Uh, so I, I missed the Annie year. But uh, yeah. that was that was pretty legendary for a long time. That was a ton of fun. Uh, and then I just I kept doing that, you know, summer theater stuff. And then I I think it was you know right that seventh grade year. I was you know thirteen and. And my mom had said to me, okay, you know, listen, you're taking piano lessons. You're taking saxophone lessons. You have your bat mitzvah this year. You have just started taking voice lessons. Uh, You've got your tennis that you're doing. Uh, So you need to go ahead and just focus on one thing because I can't keep taking you everywhere. And I just (laughs) said, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and focus on voice. So um, I had started studying with uh, Debbie Terman. Uh, She was in 
in Dyer, I do believe, Dyer, Indiana. Yeah, I remember Debbie, yeah. Yeah, she was great. Um, really good teacher, good for, uh, you know, that that 13-year-old adolescent just changing voice. Um, and I remember her recording my, my you know, what was it the 21 Italian Greatest Hits, the 21 Italian Songbook, good for kids who are, you know, the younger um, voices who are just starting to learn the, the ways of singing correctly. Um, and uh, really started taking off from there as far as practicing and learning um, more languages. I also was singing um, at Grimmer Middle School. I was in band because I wanted to be and do something other than singing, but then I was still Carol Andra, uh, the choir director at the time, allowed me to be in um, the uh, the the show choir that they had um, for Grimmer Middle School. So I was able to do that <laughs> at the same time as being in band. So I was able to kind of hone in as well uh, and not have to take choir class. So I was really fortunate to be able um, to do that. And then when, of course, when I got into high school, that's when I really just kind of said, all right, it's, it's, it's all in. Um, and that's when I really started doing more competitions. I started doing um, more with more languages. And that's when I decided I want to go ahead and continue on and, and pursue a, a bachelor in music uh, in performance. And um, I wanted to do, you know, the opera route. I don't know why it hit me because not a lot of people when they're 15 or 14 years old decide that they want to be an opera singer, <laughs> but I wanted to do it. Uh, and in fact, I went and saw my first opera when I was 15. Uh, mm. it, it was, it was Fedora at the Chicago Lyric. Um, nice. yeah. And it was Placido Domingo. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. And yeah, it just kind of, it all kind of came to fruition. That's kind of what I wanted to do. And then things have kind of evolved since then. Well, and so. you, it was one of those things where, you know, you, you know, you, you just were saying that like, oh, like what 15 year old, like, you know, decides like, oh yes, I'm going to go be an opera singer, you know, but like, it was so, it was always so apparent that like, this is just what you were going to do. I mean, the talent just like dripped off of you and like the ambition just <laughs> hey. dripped off of you where it was just like, it was so, it was so clear that this was like what you were going to pursue. Cause you were so, you know, you weren't like a nerd about it, but you were serious. I mean, it was like everyone sort of just knew like, oh yeah, this is what Hillary does. And especially, you know, like we were saying in high school, the fact that, you know, you were competing, you know, um, but then also, yeah, that you were like gigging, you know, <laughs> like whether it yeah. was like at your, at your grandmother's, you know, f functions that she was sponsoring, but um, yeah, you were going around and doing stuff. And so, yeah, it just, you always just had this aura about you where it was like, oh yeah, this is the track that Hillary's on. And it was just, um, it was just everyone, supported you because it was so obvious that that was what you were meant to be doing. I uh, wouldn't have changed. In fact, I, I think about it and I, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have parents that um, didn't try to push me to do anything else. Um, and, you know, and again, I was able to, and fortunate enough to, to be involved in, the different community theater around the area. I sang with, um, in high school, I ended up singing with the Northwest Indiana Symphony Chorus. Um, as a junior and a senior in high school, they auditioned me and let me in. And I just had, I was very, very fortunate. You know, a lot of the times it's kind of like, okay, who can you talk to or who can you convince to listen to you? Because a lot <laughs> of the times it's, it's, you know, who you know, and who really wants to pay attention to you? Um, because it, it's it's a competitive world out there, and 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 it is a lot of the times it's who you know and and where you're you know at, at the time. Uh, but I again was fortunate to have some very very supportive people. To this day, I still am in contact with my grade school music teacher. Uh, who, mm. I, I, who I, I love, uh, Mrs. Um, 
Kathy Lincourt, who was great and gracious enough. She gave me um, the Mrs. Claus role in the North Pole Goes Rock and Roll in fifth grade. I, was <laughs> I very feel like I honored. saw that photograph. <laughs> <laughs> to do that. Uh, and then, of course, Mrs. Andra, Carol Andra in middle school, who pushed me along and gave me some really great um, advice. And, of course, you and I got an opportunity to work with Mr. Lewis, who also to this day I keep in contact with and I love dearly and who the best always, of the best. I mean, I mean, seriously, he always, uh, always pushed me and, you know, always had great guidance for us. I just, I'm so thankful to have such amazing supportive music teachers. Uh, and then of course, into college, my undergraduate professor, Mary Hagopian, whom I just spoke with two weeks ago, uh, she just turned, I think, 85, which I can't believe. Wow. Um, and then I'm still in contact with my graduate school professors and people that I, I studied at the graduate school. So, uh, you know, as big and slash small that the music world is, we somehow all know the same people, even though we're not all in the same place. I've been very, very fortunate to have amazingly supportive an amazingly supportive cast in my life. So. So how did you end up at Ball State? Like how, how did, how did that, uh, how did well, that win out as your, for your undergrad studies? As my, as my undergrad. Well, I had auditioned at IU. I had auditioned at Butler. I had auditioned at uh, Cincinnati Conservatory of Music and at Ball State. Those were my top choices. And I got in uh, to uh, I used music school. They had a small um, little scholarship that they were kind of that I had because I did their summer music clinic every year, every summer. Mm. And um, and then at Butler, um, I had gotten into their music school. Ball State, I had gotten in, and they offered me a young artist award scholarship. And then CCM, I had auditioned and then we had gotten this letter saying that they didn't receive, they couldn't process my application because they didn't receive the money or something. Oh no. And, well, it was weird. It, it was before, well, right before that I had gotten the notification that I didn't get in, but then the following day they said they didn't receive the money so they couldn't look at my application. So it really didn't make any sense. And yeah, so weird. it was a little strange. Um, and then I decided, I decided, you know what? Butler's a small school. I use a massive school. <laughs> Ball State's middle of the road. I decided to go where I had the larger scholarship and the middle of the road size wise. Uh, and I'm happy that I did. It afforded me some amazing opportunities um, and amazing connections. And, um, you know, Muncie was, it, it's a small, I mean, it's a small place, but Ball State is, I think like 30,000 students. So I, I guess it's a, I guess it's middle of the size compared to, you know, IU, which is like 50 or 60,000 and Butler, which is like, I don't know. I'm not even sure how many are at Butler. Um, but I just wanted to try it out. I thought, you know what? I think this is meant to be. And I'm really happy that I did it. Uh, I just, I'm really, really, really happy because I couldn't have been happier. Again, like I said, I still talk to Mary Hugopian to this day. Um, she had studied and sang, um, she had studied at Butler. She had studied at Butler and she had gotten her master's at New England Conservatory. Uh, and then sang professionally in Germany for 20 years. Hmm. So she got an opportunity to really, uh, she was more old school as far as teaching was concerned. And, and I liked that. Um, and I also was able to get the one-on-one -on -one, uh, instruction um, that as a performance major, you need to have with, a, with an actual um, professor. IU, I was concerned that as a performance, as an undergrad, I would be taking from someone who was a teaching assistant 
because of right. how big that music school is. Right. Uh, and as good as it is, if you're not a master student or above, you don't get that one-on-one -on -one with the professors as you should. So uh, that's kind of how I ended up at Ball State. And I'm really, really happy that I did. So what were some of the highlights there? I mean, was it more sort of like a, a woodshedding time where you were really, um, you know, getting getting that instruction or was or were there, you know, big performances that, that really stand out to you from that time? Or what's what are some of those highlights from those years? Uh, highlights from those years? I got to hang out with Beverly Sills. Nice. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, in fact, there's a picture of her and I because my my voice professor was the head of the department. And so um they, uh, we had a couple different, uh, like there was like a series, it was not quite like a lecture series that happened every year for the, for the School of the Arts. And uh, she was there speaking and um, Miss Agopian had the honor of picking her up from the airport and, you know, hanging out with, um, with Beverly and, and, um, and then uh, bringing her to and from places. And so we were backstage talking with her and I went up to her and I, you know, she's like, hi, hi, Miss Sills. It's, it's an honor to meet you. Thank you so much for, for being here. We really appreciate all the insight um, that you've brought to us today. And she goes, and, and your name is, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm Hillary Webb. And I, and I said, Miss Agopian's my teacher. And she and Beverly Sills said to me, oh, I know exactly who you are. And I ah. said, you, you do. <laughs> and she said, I do. She said, I, I've heard nothing but wonderful things about you from Mary over here uh, on the way back from the airport. And I was just, I was floored that Beverly Sills knew who I was. <laughs> and so I just, like, that is phenomenal. I, I was just like, okay, all right. And I had the opportunity to, 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 to work with her for a little bit and talk with her. And she just was a joy. She was an absolute joy to speak with uh, and, and talk to and get some, some wonderful advice. Um, I had the opportunity at Ball State to do a master class with the King Singers. Um, and that was in my, you know, when, um, with, uh, when I sang with the Ball State University Chamber Choir. Uh, that was in itself I, to have an hour and a half to spend with them. Uh, and just to listen to them and then also have them listen to us and work with us and sing alongside us was incredible. Um, that was one of the most joyful, gleeful times in my, in my life. Um, uh, yeah, I still to this day, I think I have their signed poster somewhere in the house. I, I know I can <laughs> get rid of it. I don't know where it's at, but it's, it's, it's in the house someplace. Uh, they just really, I, class and elegance and, and positivity emanate from them. Um, mm. and of course they change out, you know, as, as singers age, they change out. So this was back in, you know, 1990, let's see here, 1999. So it was right before my junior recital in, um, the spring of 1999. So, um, but yeah, that was another, definitely a, a big highlight. And then um, my senior recital was, was hard. I had a lot going on that year. And it was also kind of that time where, you know, you, you were auditioning for graduate schools and trying to figure out where you want to go. Um, and it was kind of bittersweet because that's the last thing you're going to be doing. You know, there's a choir tour at the end with, with, with um, the chamber choir where we go and we travel and stuff, but it's, that's the last solo thing that you're going to be doing. Um, and so it was, it was, that was particularly bittersweet because again, it was, I was doing a lot of bigger music that I had anticipated doing. Uh, and at the end it felt really, really, really good. It felt really good and really satisfying. Because um, what was some of your repertoire at that time? At that time, I had, I remember, and I think I, I, I had, um, I had done some Brahms. I had done a couple Beethoven pieces. 
my biggest thing that I did was, is I did the letter aria from Eugene Onegin. Um, mm. And it was in English. I didn't do the Russian for it. Um, but I think about it. That was, that was uh, April of 2000. So that was t- <laughs> 20 years ago. Oh dear God. So that was 20 years ago. Uh, who's, who's aging myself? Nobody. Um, <laughs> And I, and it's funny cause I would like to revisit it now. I would like to know yeah. because as we age, you know, right now I'm, I'm, I can admit it. I'm 42. Uh, and I'm actually doing right now some of the best singing that I've ever done in my entire life. Sure. And, and I think that's because my voice is finally aged and my voice has finally come into its own. I mean, it takes women years for their voices to come into maturity Whereas men's voices mature so early and they last so much longer. Whereas right. women's voices don't mature into their late thirties. Um, I feel like I finally found my voice. So. Cause you were, you were mezzo for a long time and now you're just straight up soprano. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was right when I got to ball state, Miss Agopian said, you are not a mezzo. <laughs> and I said, okay, do whatever you need to do. <laughs> I take your, uh, I take your uh, opinion. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll listen. Uh, no, no, I am, I am probably what is called a, a full lyric soprano. Uh, but I also have coloratura in my voice. So I have a lot of movement. So um, I, I sing a lot of Bach now. Um, and um I do just all kinds of different stuff now that I never thought that I'd be able to do. So it's a different, it's definitely different from when it was, you know, 20, 20 years ago. <laughs> well, uh, as it should know. be, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it, uh, again, I would like to revisit that, the bygone era of stuff that I did 20 years ago and try to do it now to see how it would feel, just the difference on how it would feel. So, Yeah. So with the with the journey to grad school, I mean, was that just sort of a foregone conclusion, you know, when you were a senior in an undergrad that you were just like, yep, moving on like that? Or or was there any contemplation that you would take a break or try to do something else or? No, I did not want to take a break. I wanted to go on because I really just was ready. I was ready to 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 do more auditioning and to do more performing. And so. Uh, my undergraduate um, opera instructor, um, one of them, uh, Jeff Ballard, um, had uh, mentioned the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and he had studied with um, David Holly, who was the opera instructor here, and they were, actually became very good friends. And uh, he had told me about it. So this was one of my auditions. I had auditioned for Eastman and I auditioned for uh, New England Conservatory and uh, Arizona State. And when I got down to UNCG, I immediately fell in love with the area. Everything Mm. is so green. (laughs) Mm. When people speak about a Carolina blue sky, it is so clear. (laughs) I mean, just blue, blue, blue. I can't even explain the color of the blue. Um, I was in Raleigh last year just for like a okay. long weekend and yeah. was really, really charmed by by the area. Yeah. So I know it's not Greensboro precisely, but, you know, in the neighborhood. Yes. So there's a it's a different vibe. It's a different feel. I mean, things are a little bit slower and I had to get used to that. I had to get used to people calling... Um, you know, hats that they wore in the winter time, like sock hats, toboggans, they call those. <laughs> and I That's just kind cute. of looked I've at never them. Heard that. Yes, they call them, or as, as with their accents, they would call them toboggans. Uh, <laughs> and I said, I said, I'm sorry, what was that? And they're like, a toboggan. And I said, you mean the thing that you go sledding in? And they said, no, that's a sled. And I said, no, there's a sled and there's a toboggan. There are two different kinds of things that you can use to go down the hill on the snow. I said, to, you know, toboggan, you don't put that on your head. Uh, yeah, you do. And I said, no, that's hat. So there are certain <laughs> things, you know, that I had to get used to, you know, when you order your, your iced tea here, you have to say unsweetened because otherwise they'll bring you sweet tea and that's just crack tea. And then you drink it and you'll just be all hyped up and running around all over the place the rest of the day. <laughs> so don't do it. Um, 
but no, I, I fell in love with, with it here and the opportunities that UNCG's music school, I mean, UNCG, the school itself is, is, is I think like 13 or 14,000 students and the music school had, had 1500 people at it. I mean that at that time, that's a big chunk for a music school of a small university. If you think about all of the different programs that are offered here as a state hmm. school, uh, and you know, it's one of the top music schools on the Southeast right now. And I just was like, you know, I'm going to give it a try. It's a smaller school. I'm okay with it. I'm going to try it. And a lot of people have come out of here that, um, you know, also that, that, uh, David Holly, who was the music director or in the, the opera director here had known, um, that I had known at, at Ball State again. And so it was just, it was a nice, nice kind of way to, to know people ish, um, the connection again. And so I, I moved here and never looked back. And so, yeah, what, what is, what is, you know, I mean, with a school like that, you know, being, being sort of a major hub for the town, like what does the, uh, what does the musical community down there feel like, uh, for you? It's amazing. Uh, it, in Greensboro alone, Greensboro has six colleges or universities here. So for it being a smaller city, there are six schools here. Um, and in the triad alone, which the triads, Greensboro, High Point, Winston-Salem. Um, Winston-Salem has the North Carolina School of the Arts. <laughs> also a massive uh, music school, music hub. High Point University has an up and coming music school. And then of course, University of North Carolina at Greensboro has their music program. Greensboro College has a music program. Guilford College has a music program. North Carolina A&T, which is an HBCU, has a music program. Uh, Bennett College, which is an all-women's HBCU, has a music program. The arts are so prevalent in this community. Um, you know, it is, it, it is amazing how you meet someone and somehow our lives overlap. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it is, it is absolutely incredible. And, um, they just, uh, you know, between you've got the Choral Society of Greensboro, you've got the Oratorio Society of Greensboro, you've got the, um, well, Bell Canto Company, which is the group that I sing with, you've got, and of course, all the different colleges and universities have their ensembles. You've got the Greensboro Symphony, then you've got the Winston-Salem Symphony, then there's all of these offsets of all of them. You've got the Piedmont Jazz Orchestra. Um, I mean, again, they're, it's just, it's incredible. It is, um, it is so full here, not only of music, um, not only of, of the musical uh, aspect of it, but also of the visual arts and also of the theater. Um, so it really, it, it all, that's also kind of how I ended up staying here is because of, of the opportunities that it, is for, it has afforded me here. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it seems like, you know, with, with that much in the mix that you can sort of, uh, develop yourself into an area and, and it seems like you were able to like know where you were going to fit in, like as, as in, in that community. Yeah, it, it is again, it, it, it's just really, it's, it's spectacular. Um, and, and not only just from quote, like what people say, like, you know, the classical genre of music, but you've got um, the jazz festival that takes place because John Coltrane in High Point. I mean, there's just so much, so much. And I always tell people, if you ever need something to do, always check and see there's always a concert or something going on. Of course, not in the time that we're in right now, but you know, there's always something going on. So. so that's something going on. Like you, you were talking about uh, Bel Canto. Like I'd love to hear more about that company and your involvement with it. Oh, that's my second family. <laughs> no, <laughs> I uh, I had the 
pleasure of going on. Let's see. This is going to be my 18th season singing with them. Wow. Uh, yes. So I started singing with them just out of graduate school uh, when David Pegg was still conducting. David Pegg um, founded the group along with uh, Dr. Richard Cox. They, Dr. Richard Cox had another group. He, Richard Cox was one of, he was also one of my professors at UNCG and they kind of merged, merged together as far as that's concerned. Um, and if this is going on the 30, let me see here, 37th, we just finished, it would have been our 37th season. So 37 wow. years. Uh, and it is such a special amazing group of people. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about, we talk about that, you know, bel canto essentially means beautiful singing. That's it's an Italian phrase that just means beautiful singing. Uh, it's an ensemble. Uh, sometimes it varies in size. Uh, we've I've been in it as small as as thirty singers and as large as fifty seven singers, just depending on the works that we're going to be doing. Um, you know, with it, bel canto kind of embodies the power of cor live choral singing um, to entertain, but also to inspire and to heal and build a community um, and kind of, and really bring everyone together. Um, so, you know, it, it, again, started in 1982 slash 83, I think. Um, we've released over time, 12 CDs. Um, we've this past year, um, in 2019, there was a piece commissioned specifically for us by a composer by the name of Dan Forrest. He's incredibly popular right now in, in the choral world. Uh, and it was called, it's called The Breath of Life. And it was in honor of one of our um, biggest supporters and board members who uh, passed suddenly five years ago, Suzanne Goddard. And one of the things that she had left in her will was that she had wanted a piece commissioned by Dan Forrest, because that was her favorite composer specifically for us. So we were able to premiere that in October and to have, have all of us be there knowing that that was something that was so meaningful. And I had known Suzanne for, for the 20 years because I had sung with her in the Choral Society of Greensboro. And to know that this was something not only that it was just this stunning beautiful piece of music. Um, but also the fact that it, it's, it served a purpose that it served a purpose because it brought some healing to her family. It brought healing to those of us mm. who knew her. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the special thing about Bel Canto is that it can bring healing to everyone around them. We, we believe, uh, you know, that one of our sayings, or at least one of our mission statements is that we believe in the joy of singing and the power of live choral performances to entertain, inspire, heal, heal, build a community and express that which cannot be expressed by words or music alone. So that in itself tells you what we try to do. Um, and then with that, you get to build these amazing relationships with all of these people who are, you know, some are older, some are younger, some have full on music degrees or are still completing their music degrees. Some of them have a trained musical background, but are doctors. Some of them have a trained musical background and are uh, vice presidents of colleges. <laughs> so it really is it's an amazing way for everyone to get together and, and, and to share one common thing. And that's the, that music and how it can transcend from generation to generation to generation. So, yeah, I was really, yeah, I'm, I, I'd love to, yeah, that this is one of the big things I was excited to hear you talk about. Cause I, um, 
you know, in, in high school had, you know, sang in choirs and, and then sure. hadn't had a chance to do so, you know, for years and years and years. And then um, a couple of years ago, I, I spent a couple of seasons singing with the uh, Chicago Artists Chorale um, in, here in Chicago. And I had just completely forgotten, like, how amazing it is to yeah. sing in a group and then and then just how that the experience of receiving that changes I mean to you know for listeners as well you know that I you know went went back and and uh and and listened to you know previous um concerts that they'd get given that they had uh recordings up online and um hearing really beautifully done choral music is just it's so heavenly and it, and it's such a distinct thing from you know obviously being a solo classical musician or being like in a rock band I mean you know because it's like that's been my frame of reference you know for the past like 10 years or so has been like playing like club gigs and stuff and you know I've moved, mm-hmm. moved away from that a little bit but and you know and rock music can be transcendent too you know when you're of standing course. in front of a big amp and 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 it's really cooking and everyone's you know having a great time but like choral music is just it's so so special yeah and so I would just love to to hear more of like how that how that's impacted your life and and almost from like a spiritual perspective like like what's what that's like for you well it's interesting because there are i mean there are pieces that we have done where yeah they're they're cool like we've done them but they don't move us like we're just kind of like yeah i don't have to sing that again ever again it's totally fine <laughs> there have been a couple pieces where just like eh, we don't really like that but then there are those pieces where from the first note and then the next note and then in comes the different harmonies and especially when they're crunchy harmonies where the dissonance is just it the dissonance is so intense and I'm, I'm not trying to get super nerdy here, but I can't help it. It's just, I get excited and here we go. So the dissonance is so intense that it almost makes your fillings rattle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, where, you know, it's that it's that in tune and it's that right. And it makes the hairs on your arm stand up. And there is that feeling that you are making a connection with the person next to you and the person behind you and the person in front of you and your accompanist and your conductor. And then if you know that you are all collectively doing this together, And you are so in sync with each other and you can all feel it. It's like, it's almost like feeling like you can almost feel the vibrations um, of the music. And you can see it on each other's faces. I can only imagine if you're feeling that way, what that's bringing to the people who are listening to it. Um, There have been times where we are rehearsing a piece and there are certain composers where you just know you're just going to completely lose it in a rehearsal. Uh, Eric Whitaker is one. Um, He is a, just a phenomenal 21st century uh, composer. He's, he's very, very popular, especially right now with his virtual choirs that he does. Um, but there are some pieces, uh, another 21st century composer, Jake Runestead, who also, uh, is amazing. Um, you can actually go to belcantocompany.com. Um, we've got some recordings online of us and also check us out on YouTube. There's some pieces that we've done. And of course, Stand for us, Breath of Life. If you get an opportunity to listen to that, please do. Um, and I will definitely link all these in the show notes uh, for people to, to go easily to. Um, it, there is nothing more humbling 
and meaningful that when you look to the person next to you and you're singing and you both have tears in your eyes and you don't expect that, <laughs> uh, there's nothing more humbling than knowing that this music that we're doing makes us vulnerable but also moves us and also propels us to want to move others. Whether it, it brings joy to someone, whether it stirs up emotion that may be sorrowful, whether it, it calls someone to action, but there is nothing more meaningful and humbling than to be able to, to, to do that for someone. And when you spend time working with uh, your other, your fellow singers um, week after week, uh, you build a family. And in fact, Bel Canto, we just had a, a Zocktail. <laughs> we did Zoom cocktails, all oh, 45 cute. of 45 of us. <laughs> And because we all miss each other, um, you know, and because we all become this family and we just want to be next to each other, singing next to each other, we breathe together. That's just mm -hmm. it. It's that when you're standing next to that, to, the, to whomever you're standing with, there are so many things that you find out that you start linking in with. Um whether it be the vowel sound that it automatically just happens that you just start sounding like each other. When you can all start to sound like one person singing, if it's a choir of 35 people and you sound like one person, there is nothing more magical than that. It, it's uh, I never thought that, um, that I was going to be such a hardcore choral singer <laughs> at the age of 42 who, you know, had all those years of auditioning for young artist programs and singing with Greensboro opera and Capital opera in Raleigh and singing in Italy. And, you know, I never thought to myself, Oh, I'm, I'm going to be singing with a, a semi-professional ensemble for, you know, 18 years. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I, I couldn't imagine myself not doing it. It's made me a better musician. Uh, it's made me a better singer. It, mm, singing with this group of people makes me more aware of um, my breathing, of my sound, of, of everything. So. Well, that's so amazing to you know, like you were saying, you know, looking, looking to the person standing next to you, you know, and seeing tears in their eyes as well, that, um, just this idea, you know, it's, it's easy to think of like, oh, you know, we're trained musicians, we've been doing this forever. And it's, it's easy, you know, it's like, obviously, everyone loves doing it. But you know, it's like, you think like, oh, well, it's, it becomes rote at a certain point, you know, that like, well, we're just, we're doing our job, you know, and, and so to, to transcend that, where it's like, every performance really is new, and, and not only new, but brings brings that level of commitment and emotion and togetherness. I mean, that's, yeah, that's the magic of, of choral singing. Right. And, and to be able yes. to sustain that, you know, like you said, for, for 18 seasons that you've been with them. I mean, what a, what a miracle. Yeah. That's, um, and, and I agree with you 100% that you're just like, okay, well it's, you know, here we go doing this concert again, or here we go doing this again, but that's the thing in a typical bel canto season, we do two fall concerts. Uh, I do uh, five or six holiday concerts. Um, then we do an, a, a fundraiser concert, which is called Amore, which is just a great time. It's our only fundraiser concert because we are not for profit. So it's a, you know, the way that we can support the group along with the, of course, the United Arts Council and things like that for grants. Um, and then um, two spring 
concerts and that's it. Uh, and we do it every week and we rehearse every week and there are different things, but not one concert's the same and not one thing is the same and not one day is the same. You know, some of us, some people may have a really, really crappy day and then come in and then they start singing. And sometimes that crappy day can seep into how they're feeling when they're about to sing. And you have, and at that point you got to remind them and you got to talk them down and say, listen, man, you're, you're here to, to bring joy. You're here to enjoy yourself, but also bring joy to the people that, you know, are sitting out there. So, you know, think about that. So yeah, you don't, even though it's the same music that we do, um, you know, in, in a concert period, not one performance is the same and it's always something different. So it's, um, I just, I miss these people. I miss my, my conductor who, uh, the current artistic director, his name is, is Bill Young or Dr. Young. Um, I, have never actually called him Dr. Young. It was very strange to hear myself say that because he was, <laughs> he, he is a, a dear, wonderful, wonderful colleague and wonderful friend. I've known him for 20 years. I've worked with him for 20 years actually, because he was one of my professors at UNCG and he was currently getting his doctorate when I was getting my master's degree. So, hmm. uh, and he's just absolutely phenomenal. And the energy and the creativity that he brings to the organization is amazing. In fact, we're going to be doing uh, in the next week, we've got a recording next week. We're trying to, to, to be innovative and we're trying to be relevant um, in the time that we are in right now with, of course, the, the pandemic. And of course, the North Carolina, or at least um, the, I'm sorry, the National Association of Teachers of Singing and the American Choral Directors Association have essentially said, you know, singing not a good idea right now <laughs> because uh, of the transmission of, of the vapor when we're singing. Yeah. It's a respiratory thing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so you would need to have certain um, as far as height in the ceilings and things like that. So until there's really a viable vaccine, we really don't know when we're going to be able to perform live concerts anymore. God, so, what a heartbreak. My God. It is. It is. And so we're trying to figure out different ways to do things. So uh, we, in the next week, um, he sent us, there's eight of us that he sent a piece to. We are going to be recording with masks on uh, in a warehouse. Uh, and it's a piece called 365. And it is uh, hauntingly relevant and beautiful to what we are experiencing right now. Hmm. So, uh, and that should be up on our Bel Canto YouTube page, hopefully by the end of, of June. So. Ooh, I'm yeah. excited to hear that. Yeah. It's Cause yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to get, I didn't want to get super like in these times, you know, but sort of like related to what we were just saying, you know, like the gift of being able to gather, you know, with a group and, and have this transformative experience. And then to suddenly have that, that pulled out from under you. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a loss. I mean, and especially in, in, we need connection now more than ever and healing now more than ever. And to yeah. not be able to go to this vital, um, support network you know that you yeah. know yes it's a it's, it's a choir and whatever but like as far as like machinery you know like spiritual machinery you know for for connection and for uh collective joy you know that just um yeah breaks my heart that that's not that's not something that can be done in the way that it's it's traditionally done uh right now um yeah so yeah, yeah. it's uh you know i mean it's cool that you guys are you know, finding the workarounds and doing the recordings on, on acapella and, and trying to experiment with being in this warehouse and stuff. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I would just love to, to, to hear more of your thoughts on, on, uh, yeah, these workarounds and, and are they, are they a viable substitute for that, for that music making in a collective or is it just sort of like a stopgap measure or do you feel like there's, there's something irrepressible about the spirit that's going to, that's going to come out no matter the medium? You know, I think, um, I think, I think that any kind of music that's out there, any kind of, uh, you know, regardless of, if it's choral music and, and, um, you know, if we can get it out there, what, however, 
whatever means, if it's recording, uh, you know, there's again, this acapella app that we were able to uh, record our, each of us can record a voice part at home and send it to each other. And we pick a song and we're able to do that um, and then collaborate together. That can definitely bring us together. But I think, um, I don't know. I just, I just, I just want people, I guess my, my thought is, is that I want everyone to still remember that regardless of whatever kind of music and whatever we're, uh, you know, whatever kind of music is out there, um, and however, whatever medium it's being brought to you, you know, still be, still engage in it. Um, again, we're trying to be as creative as possible to, to figure out ways to still stay relevant because we've got um, an audience who, who wants to see us um, and who didn't get a chance to see us at the end of, May, of, of, of uh, April for our concerts. So I, uh, it, it, to me, music is, is, is my outlet and it's my soul. Um, and to be able to have that still as part of my life, even though it's not my full-time employment, um, I'm really, really lucky about that. Uh, it's, it's been an interesting balance. Um, but yeah, I, I'm actually, it's, it's interesting because I've for the last 10 years have been in multifamily living. So I have had a, a normal nine to six hourly kind of, you know, hour, you know, Monday through Friday, occasional weekend kind of thing. So I've been afforded the opportunity to have rehearsals Monday nights, Wednesday nights. I still teach one uh, voice student on Thursdays. And then when I have dress rehearsals on a Friday or, you know, whatnot, concerts on Saturdays and concerts on Monday nights, I'm still able to do these things. Um, I have a, a church job as well, too. Um, and so, um, and with that, that also the normal hourly, you know, the normal business time job that I have has also afforded me the, the ability to be able to have all of these, uh, outlets that I'm able to, to have. Um, and I, and I wouldn't change it any other way. Um, I've really been just so, so, uh, lucky to be able to um, have something that, you know, where I bought a house and I have insurance and all that other stuff, but then still be able to remain relevant in my music life and still be able to um, perform and give recitals and um, do recordings. And, um, you know, again, like this, this commissioned work, uh, do a brand new work. Um, Bel Canto was actually asked to perform this commission piece, um, in the fall at Carnegie Hall, uh, which would have been another world premiere, but of course, oh, wow. yeah, we, we actually ended up turning it down. Um, we had talked about it in the, that was in the fall. We turned it down because we really wanted to perfect it a little bit more, um, and, tweak things a little bit, but that would have been a huge thing for us. Um, so again, I, I, I have been so, so lucky to be able to have a work life balance, um, and to be able to travel and to be able to sing places that, uh, I never thought that I'd be able to sing at and to be able to experience the things I've been able to and to work with the people I've been able to work with. And, um, I've had the opportunity to work with John Rutter twice, uh, who, who's just, it has been amazing to work with him and, and to work under the, um, and, and when he conducted us, uh, for a couple of his pieces and yeah, I just, I, I couldn't be more fortunate and more grateful. Um, 
Because how often do you get to travel? Is that is that something you do a lot? I get to travel as often as I want. <laughs> and, you know, it's that's the thing is having weekends that I'm available. Um, you know, I can go and do something. Um, when someone has said to me, hey, can you come this coming weekend? I've, I want you to be able to you know, sing, or can you fill in and, and do this at this place? Or can you, yeah, sure. No problem. Um, and that's awesome. Uh, you know, I, the last time I traveled and did a big program was actually, um, it was right before my mom, it was about two months before my mom passed away. So it was about, um, 13 years ago. And I did an alumni recital at ball state and I am really happy I did. Cause that was the last time mom heard me sing. So it was a good, mm. it was a good thing to do. I got to perform in their new hall that they had. I got to see professors I hadn't been able to see since I had left. Um, and two of my best girlfriends came with me. Um, Julie Salona Van Gordon, who is a phenomenal lyric color to our soprano. She sang some duets with me. And um, Christy with Suseri Wong, who is another, I guess she's a phenomenal pianist, uh, both um have doctorates. Uh, we did our master's degrees together. So, uh, I was just, again, I'm incredibly fortunate to have been able to do the things that I've been able to do. Um, and a lot of the times people ask me, well, why aren't you in New York or why aren't you in LA or why aren't you in Chicago or why aren't you here? or Why aren't you here? And it's simple. I am singing more now than I did when I was in graduate school hmm. and I'm happy. And just because I am not singing at the Met or signed with IMG music or, you know, working for a major opera company doesn't mean that I don't feel um, any kind of gratification being a musician. I am incredibly proud of the work that I've done and uh, very, 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 again, fortunate to be able to, to do the things that I've been able to do. Not a lot of people can say that they're happy and I am. And, uh, and I, I'm 100% honored and, and, and amazed that I get to be around these incredibly talented musicians that I get to be with. So. That's amazing. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah, truly. It really is. So for people who want to know more about you and all of your amazing musical talents, where, where do they find you? Do you have stuff up online that you would point people to or? Yeah. I mean, really, I would just go to belcantocompany.com and they can check out, uh, again, multiple recordings and, and live, uh, concerts that we've done and also some rehearsals and then also check out Belcanto company. Um, and our, and on YouTube, there's a couple of recordings, uh, where, Actually, I've uh, I've been featured as a soloist that you can that you can see as well too. Um, but then, if they want to find us um, or find me, you can find me in the Triad area of you know in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, singing. And um, of course, when things when uh, when we're able to start singing full force again, <laughs> you'll know it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I can't wait to, um, yeah, hear, hear what you guys have coming up next. And I'm super curious about your, your 365 piece. Once you yeah. guys debut that, I'm all ears yeah. for this debut. I will, I will definitely let you know about it. It's going to be uh, amazing. So. Well, Hillary, thank you so much for just talking with me today and, and just reminding everyone who's listening about, yeah, the power of music and the power of, um, yeah, finding yourself in in a unique in, in a unique place where you're able to do what you love and and that's that's the force for good in the world, right? Is like being happy where you're 100%. at. Like what a revolution. <laughs> it's I know it's it's like a miracle or it's like it's like a light bulb it goes off. Bing. Yeah, it's it uh it really is. It you know, if people would just take it take a second to sit back and just breathe, put something on, put 
put some Sam Cooke on, put Ella Fitzgerald on, put, you know, some Coltrane on, who cares? Whatever your favorite piece of music is, just sit back, take a breath, realize what it is to be here, to be alive, to be loved by one another, and know that music is always there to give you a hug and to wrap its arms around you. So, yeah, Amen. thank you again. Thank you again. <laughs> I really could not be more fortunate and uh, honored to be here with you today. This is super fun. So a big part of why I've been wanting to have Hillary on the podcast goes beyond her delightful wit and fabulous stories. It was that sneaky little section there right toward the end of our talk where she's completely transparent about the fact that she has a full-time day job. Yes, this world-traveling, highly accomplished vocalist is able to do all these wonderful things because music can remain a creative and soul-fulfilling part of her life rather than needing to be the thing that makes her money. I mean, obviously, no shade to folks who are able to do music as their main source of income or can support themselves with a Patreon or whatever. But I find that even the notion of, quote, work-life balance is usually too simplistic and reductive. It's never going to be possible to achieve true balance in any parts of our lives. And even if we do for a moment, it's going to get unbalanced by stuff usually well beyond our control. Like, obviously, the coronavirus situation putting a complete halt to live performance right now. But what is it about our creative practices that encourages us to work within those constraints? How can the beauty and fulfillment that our art brings to our lives buoy us and give us purpose beyond the ego stroke that might come from being able to claim that we're a professional artist? Hillary has found it in the vibrant arts community that she's actively engaged in where she lives. I find that rootedness that she's found they're tremendously inspiring, and not because it's aspirational, but precisely because it's the equal but opposite action that allows her voice to truly soar. So be sure to look up Bell Canto Company online, where you can watch videos of their live performances and purchase CDs of their many stunning recordings. And as always, links to Bel Canto's website and to miscellaneous additional materials mentioned during the course of our conversation are available on my website, queenofpeaches.com. Thank you so much for listening. Bye for now. <laughs>